Oke, okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Um, the discussion today is about the role of money and price level in the long run. Most part of the discussions are taken from chapter 29 and chapter 30 of the main key book, Principle of Economics. And some parts, especially when talking about money creation and the monetary control, I took some explanation from Cash and Fair textbook. Before we are talking about how money could affect the price level in the long run, we need to understand about the monetary system in an economy. Uh, let's take a look at the coverage here. It may include the nature of uh, money and the money supply, how money or money supply is created, as well as who will be involved in the money creation process. Understanding the process will let us know how the authority controls the money supply, what instruments can be used, and what problems facing the authority in doing the policy effectively. Let's begin with the nature of money. You may find the definition of money in the textbooks easily. Money, basically, is any kind of assets widely accepted by all people in the economy as means of payment. Therefore, the first and the most important function of money is as a medium of exchange. You exchange your money with goods and services you'd like to purchase from sellers of the goods and services. How much do you have to exchange your money? It of course depends on the value of the goods and services that you would like to buy. The value, as you already know, is expressed in terms of price. And the price itself is expressed in terms of money. Clear, isn't it? In this regards, money functions as a unit of account. Not only you purchase, your debt, your bank account, and your wealth are all also expressed or valued in terms of amount of money. Now, if you save your wealth, whether in the form of property, clothing, collection of goods, or financial assets like bonds and stocks, basically what you're doing is storing the value of your wealth. You may want to keep or sell them now or in the future. I think you must realize too that you can also store your wealth in the form of a bank deposit or simply money in your wallet. Similarly, you may withdraw your money or use your money now or in the future depending on your needs. Your assets, your money, here serve as a store of value. The value is there for you to keep and use in later or future transaction. About commodity and fiat money, I think no further explanation is needed. The former uses commodity as money, this uh, money has intrinsic value, while the latter uses others such as paper or coins whose intrinsic, val whose intrinsic value is low or almost none. Okay, after knowing the nature and functions of money, let's talk about money measured in economics or in an economy. It's interesting to know that in the past, paper money is backed up entirely by gold. Remember the story about Goldsmith and his warehouse in our previous meetings? Printed the seed of the gold storage at the warehouse can serve as money in a society. People truly believe that the receipt represents the ownership of certain amount of gold in Goldsmith warehouse. Then, Goldsmith realized that normally, people will not suddenly and withdraw their gold altogether at the same time. Because of this, he thought that it is possible to make loan using the receipt of gold storage he printed. This loan needs not to be backed up by gold. As a result, amount of receipt value of gold storage is now more than the actual amount of gold in Goldmith's warehouse. So look here the message I'm telling you. Money is initially backed up by gold in the past. Currently, it is backed up by the central bank's net assets. Money that are being backed up by the central bank's net assets are what we call now best money or M0. Of course, just like in the Goldmith's uh, story, the value of all transactions in economy is much, much bigger than the value of M0. 
it is not only because money changes hand quickly but also because the actual amount of money used in the transaction is indeed very much bigger than the m0 what is best money right now it is the summation of currency and the commercial bank's money stored as reserved in the central bank currency is amount of money printed by the central bank which are coin and paper we hold in our pocket or our wallet and those are held by commercial uh, bank in their vaults. next we have m1 or sometimes called narrow or transaction money it is the most common measurement of money it is bigger than m0 it includes currency and also all relatively liquid deposits in all commercial banks your deposits that can be withdrawn from the ATM machines or can be transferred when you buy something online is one example of such liquid demand deposits since M1 includes demand deposits so whenever more loans and thus more deposits are made it means more money will be available in the economy we're gonna talk about it soon on the other hand M2 or broad money is certainly bigger than both M0 and M1 it is M1 with additional less liquid money such as time deposit and this M2 is broadly used as well especially when the policymakers would like to see the connection of money to real economic variables after you understand about the nature and the definition of money let's now discuss about uh, money creation that is how money is growing bigger and bigger than its initial amount of the best money to comprehend this we need to know the simple t balance sheet in accounting you know balance sheet basically consists of assets on the left side and liabilities plus net worth on the right side which are exactly at the same amount of money when we're looking at the monetary authorities balance sheet its net foreign asset and net domestic assets will be put on the left best money the liabilities for the uh, monetary authorities as well as net worth would be put on the right commercial banks balance sheet will look similar assets on the left and liabilities on the right okay let's see now what will happen when somehow deposit is made in the economy before we proceed suppose here for simplicity that there is no currency in circulation meaning that people don't hold cash at all they deposit all their money in their bank account what happens next simple once deposit is made banks reserve increases at exactly the same amount of the deposit if initial deposit is $100 then reserves is also $100 you know reserve here is the deposit received by the commercial banks but have not yet loaned out what will happen then if the bank makes loans suppose since the central bank as precautionary requires every bank to put a minimum 10 percent of their deposit in reserve it's uh, the red small cap letter r in our slide can you see then the maximum amount of deposit deposit or the excess reserve that can be loaned out by the bank is the remaining 90 percent of its deposit look at the first bank's balance sheet the deposit is 100 dollars with 100 dollars deposit then the minimum reserve would be 10 dollar or 10 percent of the bank's total deposits if bank wants loans out all its excess reserves loans that will be made is as much as $90 now look at the second bank's balance sheet if $90 loans received by borrowers from the first bank are put in bank 2 then bank 2 receive $90 deposits what will happen if, second, if the second bank doesn't loan out uh, its deposit if bank 2 doesn't make loans then its deposit will be just exactly the same as its reserve which are $90 what can we observe from here you may notice that in this case just one loan is made but you know what even with one new loans money supply already increases 
Remember, M1 is currency plus deposits. With no currency, money supply is just total amount of deposits. How much is uh, money supply or total deposit? Before the loan is made, it is $100. The amount of deposit in the first bank account. After the loan from bank one, it is now $190 deposit in total or $190 of money supply. $100 is coming from deposit at the first bank and $90 is coming from deposit at the second bank. See, just one loan is made but money supply already increases. How about the total reserve? With or without loans, total reserve will be the same. It's still $100, which comes from $10 of Bank 1's reserve plus $90 of Bank 2's reserve. How is it now if banks, all banks, not only Bank 1 and Bank 2, provide loans as much as the law could allow them to? That is, 90% of their total deposit. Look, Bank 1, as in our previous case, loan out 90% of its deposit or $90 out of $100. Bank 2 now also makes loans out of $90 of its current deposits. It loans out 90% of it or as much as $81. Bank 3, who receives the new deposits of $80, $81, also make loans out of its $81 deposits 90% of it, or $72.90, is loans. It continues like this until bank number N. We can easily observe total money or total deposits in all commercial banks are growing. Look at the figure circle red. Of course, it doesn't stop at bank 3 in reality. New $72.90 loans from bank 3 could create another deposit and then another loan, another deposit, another loan, and so on. Therefore, from initial deposits of just $100, now total deposit in the economy is as much as $1,000 using geometric series formula. That is what we call money creation process. How many in our case is multiple 10 times? The multiplication factor is called the money, the money multiplier. Money multiplier measures how much money or deposit is multiple from its initial amount. If initial de deposit or money is $100 and the final amount of money is $1,000 in the uh, banking system, so money multiplier is simply $1,000 per 100 equals to 10. So 10 is the money multiplier. Since how much loans can be made depends on the reserve requirement ratio, or 10% in our case, the money multiplier actually is 1 per R, or 1 per 10%, which is equal exactly to 10. You may easily guess, if R is bigger, loans that can be made will be smaller, hence lower money multiplier and lower money supply. Likewise, if currency is introduced here, the bigger the tendency of people to hold money, the lower the deposit and the lower of loans that can be made. Thus, both money multiplier and money supply will be lower too. Here, I would like to show you the balance sheet of total commercial banks in economy. As I explained earlier, when we limit the discussion to just bank one and bank two, when loan is made, it will affect total deposits, but not total reserves. Initial deposits are $100. <clears throat> with loans after loans or with money creation process, the money supply, circle red, add up to $1,000, while reserves, circle green, remain $100. This $100 is the total amount of reserve if all banks fulfill the reserve requirement policy at exactly 10% of their total deposits. The rest will be loaned out. Total $900 loans or 90% of, uh, of total deposits. Okay, do you understand the money creation process now? 
uh, relaxed there will be more example to come especially when we're discussing how many supply can be controlled in the next topic in this slide I would just like to talk briefly first you may need to know about the more realistic balance sheet of the commercial banks we know the purple table it is what we just got before the blue table this is what I told you is the more realistic one despite not yet complete either on the asset size there are now commercial bank securities other than just loans and reserves. On the liability side, we add commercial banks' debt and capital. They are, for sure, are all important to understand the so-called capital adequacy ratio or CAR and the leverage ratio. Well, um, I leave it to you to understand what the CAR and the leverage ratio are because they are just matters of definition. Um, what I want to emphasize first is how commercial banks may actually be more restricted in providing their loans. We know earlier the reserve requirement ratio has restricted banks' ability to provide loans, hence limit the creation of money supply. Other than that, bank is actually also required to maintain capital adequacy ratio or CAR at a minimum certain level. When the CAR of certain bank is lower than the minimum level, the bank must either increase their capital or reduce their loans. If the latter is chosen, money supply will be affected since less, le less loans means less deposit in the banking system and less deposit means less money supply. As for the average ratio, it is important to know how higher leverage ratio could increase CAR significantly when there is an increased value of some bank's asset, but could make banks insolvent too when the opposite occurs. That's what I would like you to know. Let us now talk about how the monetary authority or the central bank could control money supply. The first way to do it is by doing the so-called open market operation. Here, the central bank may buy government bonds or commercial bank securities or sell its own securities in the market. But before we proceed, I would like to remind you this. With no reserve, money supply is total amount of deposit in commercial bank's account. Money supply will increase whenever the central bank pour more money to the economy, enabling banks to disperse more loans. On the other hand, whenever money is absorbed by the central bank or commercial bank loans become more limited, then money supply will decrease. Okay, let's see how the open market operation could affect money supply. Suppose the central bank purchases government bonds or commercial bank security worth $50. Before the purchase, the position is as shown in the first purple table here. Total money is equals to total deposit, which is $1,000. And then with 10% reserve requirement ratio, the reserves are $100 and loans will be $900. So, what will happen after the purchase? Since there's no currency here, the central bank uses bank's reserve to buy it. It means the central bank will increase one commercial bank's reserve in uh, their account. Which bank? Of course, it is the bank who sells the security to the central bank. Or in government bond purchase case, it is the bank where the government puts its money in. So with uh, $50 more reserve or deposit, money creation process will take place. With 10% uh, reserve requirement ratio, this additional $50 reserve or deposit would create additional $500 deposit in total, or it is $500 more money supply. Money supply, therefore, is now $1,500. So remember the money multiplier effect. This $500 uh, is exactly 10 times uh, the reserves. 10 is the money multiplier, which is uh, 1 per reserve requirement ratio or 1 per 10%. How much additional loans are created from the balance sheet? We can get 
it is $500 of additional deposits minus the $50 additional reserve which is equals to $450 so the flow is uh, simple purchase of securities by the central bank will increase uh, bank's reserve and with more loans can be made now it will increase banks deposit multiple times depending on the reserve requirement ratio of course and it eventually increases the money supply here is the uh, second option the central bank may lend money to commercial banks it sets a discount rate in the money market and then the commercial banks are more likely to borrow more if the discount rate is lower and borrow less if the discount rate is higher okay let's see how changing the discount rate may affect money supply suppose the central bank reduces the discount rate hence loan to commercial bank increases before the increased loan to commercial banks just like before the position is as shown in the first purple table total money is equals to total deposits which is $1,000 and then with 10% reserve requirement ratio, the total reserves are $100 and total loans are $900. So what will happen after the bank lending increases, say it's by $20? Since again, there's no currency involved here, the central bank uses bank's reserve to lend the money. It means the central bank will increase commercial bank's reserve by $20. With $20 more reserve, money creation process will again take place. And with the 10% reserve requirement ratio, this additional $20 reserve would create additional $200 deposit in total or 200 more money supply. Money supply is now $1,200. This additional $200 is exactly 10 times of the additional reserves or the money multiplier. How much additional loans are created? From the balance sheet, we can get $200 of additional deposits minus the $20 additional reserve that added with the $20 of total amount owed to the central bank. So the total additional loans are $450. So the flow can be observed here now from the increase in uh, bank loan it will increase bank's reserve and uh, its debt to all to the central bank and then with more loans that can be made it increases it increases uh, bank deposits multiple times depending on the reserve requirement ratio and again it eventually increases the money supply it's the third way to control money supply Increasing reserve requirement ratio means allowing commercial banks to make less loans. With the same amount of reserves, commercial banks now offer less loans. Look again illustration. Same initial condition, total money supply is $1,000. And then after the increased reserve ratio says from 10% to 20%, um, $100 worth of reserve now can only create $500 deposits, not $1,000. Deposits are created five times of the total reserves, not 10 times anymore. The money multiplier or one per reserve ratio declines from 10 to 5 or from 1 per 10 percent to 1 per 20 percent. So in total, Money supply decreases by uh, $500 following the decrease in loans by $500 too. Total money supply is now just $500, declines from $1,000, and loans are $400 or declines in declining from $900. The last way to control money supply is by increasing or decreasing interest paid to commercial banks for their reserves holding in the central bank. In the past, reserve usually offered no interest. But now, many central banks, including the United States uh, Fed, offer interest for commercial banks' reserve. Impact of increasing uh, interest for reserve 
is just similar to the impact from increasing reserve requirement ratio in our last case. It reduces both deposits and loans, but leaves total reserve unchanged. Unlike the loan to bank case, here banks, banks are not getting more reserve from the central bank. Banks just reduce their loans for holding more reserve. In our example, for instance, the reserve requirement ratio is 10%. It means $100 reserves are supposed to be able to create $900 loans, thus $1,000 deposits or 10 times the reserves uh, amount. Money supply will be $1,000. But now, with increased interest on reserves, banks may find it more attractive to add their reserve holding rather than to provide loans. So instead of providing 900 loans, banks may only provide 400 loans or $500 less. The resulting deposits and money supply are then only $500 or $500 less. The impact, as I said, is just like the previous case. In our case here, increasing the interest on reserve is just like increasing reserve requirement ratio from 10% to 20%. Hopefully, nature of money, money creation process, and way to control money supply are clear for you all. With the video, you may also slow it down to comprehend all the explanation. But of course, if it still doesn't work, you are free to ask later on. And here, our last discussion about monetary system is about problems in controlling money supply. And I will just give the short explanation on this, thus allowing us to discuss the relation between money growth and inflation in the long run uh, right away. Uh, here, the first problem, which is due to the unpredictability of depositors' behavior. Look at the first table. It is a, deposit, a depositor's balance sheet. It is like uh, my balance sheet, your balance sheet. So look, we may have that in our uh, liability sites or something earned from our work, our work or business. That is the, our net worth. Our money in our bank account is of course uh, one of our assets. And our deposit will be put on the asset sites, not on the liability sites. In our previous discussion about money creation and money control, we assume that there is no currency. In fact, all of us hold cash, right? Amid more intense use of e-money. Individuals are assumed to have no financial investment options other than putting their monies in the banks. In fact, people may buy stock and bonds or fixed assets like property. Both conditions, to some extent, might reduce the control of monetary authority. Cash holdings and securities holding may induce the banking system reserve. When people tend to hold more currency, for instance, because they lose confidence to banking system, money supply falls even without any action from the central bank. Um, similar to individuals, banks' behavior could be unpredictable too. Making loans are actually not the only option for the banks to generate income. Just like in our previous case, banks may be attracted to hold more reserves, thus lowering the loans. They could also prefer buying more securities in financial market to making loans. Or they could just restrict themselves in making loans due to the bad economic and financial condition. Okay, so that's all about the monetary system. Okay, um, what can you observe guys from this slide? I will not explain too much about this topic. I expect you to read more about it by yourself and discuss later in group using whichever online media available. Well, the topic is about uh, money growth and inflation in the long run. And when we're talking about long run condition, you know from week to week discussion, it is the area of the classical theory. The classical theory believes in almost uh, perfect adjustment in the market. And in the long run, demands are said to have no significant influence on real economy. So real variable in the economy like uh, real GDP or real output can only be influenced by aggregate supply. Um, moreover, uh, this is our concern right now, money supply 
is said to be neutral to the real economy, just like the aggregate demands, but is closely correlated with um, price level. The classical theory of inflation basically suggests that inflation is purely a monetary phenomenon. We know the higher the price level, the lower the value or purchasing power of money. It is easy to understand. When orange, for instance, is uh, to 20,000 rupiah per kilogram, so 100,000 rupiah can buy 5 kilograms of orange. But when the price of orange increases to 40,000 rupiah per kilogram, the money now can only buy 2.5 kilogram or half its initial purchasing power. In other words, if we still would like to buy 5 kilograms of orange, we need more money. Therefore, it just makes sense that people will demand more money when the value of money is lower or when the price level is higher. The diagram shows exactly this. The negatively sloped money demand curve indicates the negative correlation between the value of money and the demand for money. Lower value of money, the one per P on the left vertical uh, axis, or higher price level on the uh, right vertical axis results in higher demand for money. The money supply curve is drawn vertical, indicating that the supply is set by the monetary authority or it is policy made. It is not directly affected by value of money or inflation. In fact, um, as the suggestion said earlier, it is money supply that would affect the inflation not necessarily vice versa. Looking at the figure, we could say that, just like in other markets, equilibrium occurs when supply meets demand. Any change in money supply and or money demand will affect the equilibrium. So, what will happen if money supply increases? Using the diagram, we can answer it. More money supply, other things remain constant, will shift the supply curve to the right. Excess supply will occur and lead to the higher quantity of money and lower value of money or higher price level. Well, here it is. Quantity of money directly affects price level and growth of money causes inflation. That's the quantity theory of money is all about. The quantity equation itself will soon follow. The theory also implies the so-called classical dichotomy and money neutrality concept. Since quantity of money only affects price or the value of money, it is uh, said neutral to output. That's why it's called money neutrality concept. It can be combined with the classical dichotomy concept, the concept that separates nominal and real variables. It is said that money can only affect nominal variable, just the monetary value of output, but not real variable or output measure in physical unit. We already talked about the quantity theory earlier. Now here is the equations as expressed by mv equals to py. And py is the total value of transaction in economy, which is the um, multiplication of the price level p and level of output or level of transaction y. The equation says that the transaction value is equal to nominal value of money M times its uh, velocity V. So here the velocity can be expressed as a V equals to PY per M. And it shows how many times money can serve transaction in the economy or how quickly money changes hand or it can also be interpreted as uh, how easy money can be transferred. So how does uh, velocity change? You know, the more development in financial system and the less and less tendency of people to hold more money may increase the velocity of money. The more frequent use of credit card and e-money, for instance, what do you think? With more credit card and e-money, money now will be transferred or change hand more quickly to serve more transaction, correct? It may not directly affect the money supply, all the money multiplier is clearly affected, but what is more sure is that it impacts the velocity of money. 
In the long run, however, as classical theory and U.S. data suggest, velocity of money is relatively stable. With uh, money neutrality in the long run, output or transaction, the Y variable, is for sure not affected by money supply nor by velocity of money. Output in the long run, as we learned two, three weeks ago, is only affected by supply factors such as change in factors of production and uh, the, technology, the technology availability. Okay, then uh, it leaves us with only two variables that's moved together in our equations, which are quantity of money and price level. And just like the discussion before, the equation also tells us that quantity of money directly affects price level. When we express all terms in their growth, it would mean that growth of money causes inflation. Thus, inflation is said to be purely a monetary phenomenon. Well, guys, the remaining issues here are inflation issues. I will only explain uh, two of them and also it briefly. First, there is a so-called inflation tax when government is printing money to finance its huge budget deficit. As you know, huge budget deficit will increase uh, the aggregate demand, but in the long run, as the uh, classical theory holds, it does not affect output, but instead only affect the price level. So since the act most likely results in long run high inflation, so the inflation is just like a heavy tax to all people in the economy, hence it is called an inflation tax. Um, secondly, how the, about the Fisher effect? Recall about the money dichotomy, nominal and real variable distinction. Fisher here distinguishes uh, nominal interest rate and real interest rate, whereas real interest rate would only be affected by other real factors in the economy. Nominal interest rate will move along with the other nominal variable, the inflation rate. So here, the higher the inflation rate, the higher the nominal interest rate. That's the uh, main um, interpretation of the Fisher's effect. Okay, um, the rest I will leave it to you. Okay, that's all from me today. Please comprehend the remaining issues here, the claw, the cause of inflation, and then after you're watching my video, understanding the uh, explanation. So I'm going to give you a test in uh, a mass. Please do it uh, individually, uh, given the uh, designated time. Okay, thank you.